Today, I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, Swan Private. Now, you know from listening to this show that our money is broken. Fortunately, we have Bitcoin, a better money that will help us build a brighter future. But if you don't have a Bitcoin strategy and a trusted partner to help you execute that strategy, then you're probably going to fall behind. Now, I've known the Swan Bitcoin team for years. The Bitcoiners at Swan are mission driven and have deep expertise and respect in the Bitcoin space. In my opinion, this is the team you want on your side. Today, I'd like to highlight Swan's private client services division, which guides high net worth individuals and businesses around the world toward building and preserving wealth with Bitcoin. So visit swanprivate.com and learn how this concierge service gives you direct access to your dedicated Bitcoin advisor by phone, messaging, and email. Swan will guide you on complex areas such as self-custody, or you can choose to hold your Bitcoin through Swan with one of the largest US regulated custodians. So make your first purchase with Swan Private and get $100 of Bitcoin. Just tell them that I sent you. You know, an opportunity like this to build and preserve legacy impacting wealth for your family and company will not likely be seen again in our lifetimes. Sign up at swanprivate.com today, mention breed love to your advisor and get $100 in free Bitcoin when you make your first buy. Anish Carve, welcome back to the What Is Money Show. It's good to be here again, Robert. Great to have you. Um, had you on previously and we had quite an interesting conversation about some of your written work. And this time we're gonna be diving into a book by Thomas Sowell titled Discrimination and Disparities. And just by way of quick introduction, again, for my audience, you are an entrepreneur and computer scientist, currently the CTO of Quilt Data, where data comes together. Um, we were just talking offline that we should probably preamble this discussion a little bit, given that it does touch on some sensitive topics, especially in the cultural climate of the world today. Um, and I guess the first thing I would say about that is, you know, you and I, seem to be strong advocates for freedom, the rights of the individual. Um, and in my opinion, this is really the, the minority that matters is the ultimate minority itself, the individual. Um, and I think you said you had some points wanted to talk about uh, how governments are basically lying with statistics. And this book is, is breaking that down. Yeah, I love that theme. And, and I think this preamble is really important. And I think both you and I are coming from a freedom maximalism, or at least a libertarian perspective, where every individual merits treatment as an individual, and their race or their gender does not matter at all. Their opportunity in life should not be a function of those variables. And the very interesting thing, I think the reason to start with that is that this book treats some very sensitive statistics about race, about gender, about place of birth, and unfortunately, that is used by statists and authoritarians to lie and argue for more intervention, when in fact, many of those interventions are the causes of the disparities that we're seeing. Mm -hmm. And if I can, I'd, I'd like to drop a, a little landmark in there for the conversation, which is this concept of the invincible fallacy. And what Sowell is really attacking in discrimination and disparities, a lot of his other works as well, A Clash of Visions, I believe, what he's really attacking is the invincible fallacy, which says wherever there are disparate outcomes, the cause must have been either discrimination or racial differences. Mm -hmm. And ironically, this is the rallying cry of politicians everywhere. As soon as they see numbers that are slightly different, slightly off of randomness, they use that as an excuse to interfere in the process of self-sorting and the process of the market. So what we're attacking here is not in any way the rights of individuals. We are attacking false interpretations of statistics mm -hmm. and a false and seductive vision that has gripped the political left and gripped society as a whole is that wherever we see non-random outcomes, there, it must have been the result of discrimination or genetic differences among people. And, and neither of those empirically are true. Yeah, that's an excellent point. Um using statistics then to justify coercion or intervention into the market process. And that actually typically exacerbates the thing it's trying to remedy. Um, and it's all, all because it's really built on this faulty notion that it is the consequence of intentional nefarious discrimination. Right. And, and soul gets into this, that there's the term 
discrimination is a bit ambiguous. Like it's one thing to be discriminating in a sense of choosing the right bottle of wine to drink. Right. There's a different version of discrimination where you're like, I just don't like th these people based on their culture or their race or their religion, whatever it may be. Um, and so all that nuance, he, he really parses that apart, but I think it's good that we said that right here at the top of the series. Um, and the other, I guess, other point just to make here, inequality, like equality has such a positive connotation to it. Inequality has this negative connotation. But in fact, like reality is inequality, right? We're all different. We all have different skills, experiences, know-how, biological characteristics, all of these things. And the free market actually takes advantage of our inequalities, right? Allows us to specialize in one domain and then depend on the specializations of others and we trade. So we all benefit from one another's specialization. So it's kind of like uh, maybe a either a paradigm flip or just going from first order to second order thinking where you think, oh, inequality, bad, get rid of that. But if you're like, well, if you get rid of inequality, you're talking about getting rid of the market process itself that generates all the wealth in the world so it, it just doesn't right. you need to embrace inequality because it is the it is the reality we live in and the best way to benefit from it i think is the free market process i'd like to jump into a concrete example about this concept of inequality and how again statists and authoritarians use statistics to lie so the Elizabeth Warrens of the world have, they will tell everybody, well, the upper 1% are gaining all the wealth. Mm -hmm. Now let's x-ray that statistic with the Sowellian mindset for a moment. The first and most important realization is that there's no such thing as the upper 1%. There is tremendous income mobility. I'll give you an example. You could be a farmer who earns $50,000 a year. And then one year you sell your farm and you need this money to live for the next 20 years to support your family in retirement. That one year, Let's say you have a million dollars in income from selling your farm. You jump into the 1% and you immediately fall out. So the upper 1% is not a fixed quantity. The only governments think in averages. And in fact, it's even deeper than that. Inequality and income mobility are the same thing. Mm -hmm. So the thing that governments pretend to hate in the name of justice, which is inequality, is also the thing that allows people to move from the lowest quartile to the third quartile to the fourth, all the way up to the top of the income ladder. Mm -hmm. Right. So it isn't that there is a fixed quantity of people who are unequal men or women, white people, black people, brown people, one to another. There are different individuals at different times who are in different strata. And guess what? That's exactly what we want, because it means that individuals have mobility across these strata. Mm -hmm. And these categories that governments use to lie aren't fixed categories at all. I'll give you one more quick example and then and then turn it back to you for a brainstorm. This concept of household income is used to lie tremendously. And I'll give you an example. The reason for that is the size of a household is not in any way fixed. Mm -hmm. So statisticians, government statisticians or other leftist economists can basically say, okay, a household is this many people. Let's take an example. Let's say you have a household income of $100,000 because it contains two people earning $50,000. Well, if they both individually get richer and now earn $60,000 a piece in a year, they split off into two different households. And guess what? Household, household income goes down mm -hmm. and governments can report that and cry about that. But the truth of the matter is individuals got wealthier. Mm -hmm. And so we have to be very, very careful with categories and statistics yes. and paradoxes of statistics before we make social changes based on our misreading of those numbers. And that's really Sowell's thesis in this book. That's a great point. There's this, you know, we need to think in these categories or cohorts of people to um, make thinking simpler or easier. But there is a danger if we start to take those cohorts or categories for the thing itself, right? And, um, right. and you know, Mises makes this point a lot that, and, and Rothbard as well, that society, there's no society that thinks or wants or, or you know, has these different emotions. <laughs> There's just individuals within a society, each individual having their own thoughts and emotions that we, we tend to anthropomorphize, I guess, society or all these different categories, any, any cohort or group of people, rather than thinking at the granularity of the individual. And that's where that can cause your thinking to go awry, I guess, is a, a larger point. So um, I'm going to read just a quick excerpt here in chapter one to get us rolling. Soul writes... 
in regard to disparities and prerequisites, which is another imp important point or concept rather that he uses. He writes, yet the disparities and outcomes found in economic and other endeavors need not be due to either comparable disparities in innate capabilities or comparable disparities in the way people are treated by other people. The disparities can also reflect the plain fact that success in many kinds of endeavors depends on prerequisites peculiar to each endeavor. And a relatively small difference in meeting those prerequisites can mean a very large difference in outcomes. And he goes on to put some math behind this. And I think you do a great job of explaining this where there's say there's five prerequisites for a job and you have, you know, a certain chance of, a, of having each prerequisite um, to meet the criteria for whatever this job or role is um, that you don't to have all five, you have a much lower probability basically of having any one. Yeah, I'd love to talk about that. And I, I got excited, Robert, because Seoul is a precursor to Taleb and complexity economics without even knowing it. And what he just explained is that you can have a very small difference in prerequisites that leads to a very large difference in outcomes. What are those? Those are butterfly effects, which mm -hmm. we've talked about in the past. And I want to give this mathematical illustration. So for a moment here, let's assume that everybody, everybody in the world has a fair coin to flip. Okay, we flip that. So you have a 50, let's say heads is winning in the economic environment and tails is losing. Well, we're going to have a very, very reliable in the aggregate statistical distribution where half of the people win and half of the people lose. Now, let's suppose for a moment that you need to you need to flip five heads. So first of all, all the coins are fairly distributed. Everybody has an equal shot. Everybody's flip has the same probability associated with it. Right. Now, if you need five heads to win, what's going to happen? It's not going to be 50% of the people that win. It's going to be one in 32 people who win, mm -hmm. right? Because you have to succeed at every single successive flip. Mm -hmm. And there are all these factors in human capital, such as access to literature and science, technology, and medicine, literacy itself, perhaps access to a computer. There are all these different factors of success. Nobody knows ahead of time what they're going to be. And they are in some sense randomly distributed, but guess what? When the market decides that these qualities are preeminent and are necessary, suddenly a group of people who is by definition in the minority statistically appears and begins to dominate. Mm -hmm. And good examples of this, uh, we saw the Japanese rise in the 19th century. They were nowhere for a long time. In the 14th century, the Chinese were completely, Europe was in the dark ages. And the Chinese emperor made a decision that the rest of the world is so backwards, we're going to blockade ourselves from the, get, from the rest of the world. Guess what? That happened just at a time when Europe was starting to lift themselves out with science, technology, engineering, and medicine. And that China ended up depriving themselves of two, three, four, five hundred 500 years of progress mm -hmm. because this decision that they made because they were so far ahead. And the key thing to establish here is that yesterday's laggard group can be tomorrow's leading group. Uh, another example, which is treated in the book, is that in the 1800s, 1700s, there was nary a mention of the Jewish people in science, technology, engineering, and medicine. As the 20th century came into view, the 19th century, the end of the 19th century came into view, the United States started admitting Jews in large numbers and had much less discriminatory. I mean, Europe had any number of abominable. They used to say, no Jews, no dogs on the science, right? Mm -hmm. As the United States welcomed the Jewish people, they boom, suddenly rose to the top and became overrepresented in science, technology, engineering, and medicine. The Ashkenazi Jews have like, you know, are overrepresented in Nobel Prizes. Why? Because in this multi, in these multiple hidden variables, multiple success criteria, you must have all in order to make the cut. Mm. And so this statistical game is being played all around the world at different times. And again, it's not, it's just the opposite of what leftist politicians will tell you. It's not that inequality is bad. It's that this inequality and distribution of and variety of human capital allows for mobility because yesterday's yeah. laggard can be tomorrow's leader. Yeah, well, excellently said. Um, and just to echo back something you said, he has, he has effectively intuiting complexity economics and in complexity theory, as you said earlier, the butterfly effect. This basically means that very small changes in initial conditions, which he's calling prerequisites here effectively, can lead to very large disparities in outcome, right? The butterfly that flaps its wings in Australia creates exactly. a hurricane on the other side of the world. 
there's this amplification that that occurs uh, when events propagate through a complex system, basically. And I think, um, not to get too far out over our skis, maybe this is related to another Talebian concept too, which is ergodicity. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Where there's, you know, to, it's one thing to think in group probabilities, like, oh, this group is all flipping a coin, so they all have a 50-50 shot. But it's another thing to think about the individual level probability. Like, what is the individual's probability of flipping the, the, the flipping the coin and getting heads five times in a row. Like, like I think you said it's one in 32 versus one in two. So again, there's right. this, there's this exponential amplification, like in this case, uh, a, a diminishment of the odds for the individual to hit that thing five times in a row. Um, I'm so glad so, you brought that up. Oh, yeah, go, go ahead. ahead. Finish your thought. No, no, please go ahead. Yeah. On the ergodicity front. So soul gives a really interesting example of this and Ergodicity, so the way I think of it is from ergo, like therefore. So mm -hmm. ergodic, I hope I'm getting this right. Ergodic is path dependent, mm -hmm. okay? And in an ergodic system, the path affects your outcome. And the ensemble average probability is different from the individual's probability. Yes. And I wanna, I wanna give some examples of that because Sowell talks about this in the book. He says, this is why, so again, we're talking about different ways states lie with statistics. One is with household income. The other is with what are called survey results. And what Sol explains is you could go and survey everybody who's ever played Russian roulette and conclude that there's no risk of playing Russian roulette because 100% of the survey respondents said, I didn't die when I played Russian roulette. Right. So there's an ergodic path dependence to that, that people who were on the path that led to them shooting themselves in the head aren't even, it's survivorship bias. They're not even in right. the final statistics. That's a great point. So yeah. this, this path dependence of individuals and groups of individuals through the world is extraordinarily important. And it's precisely why over simple government models that only look at averages, there's no such thing as an average person. There are individuals doing individual things. Sometimes there are group characteristics, which we can reason about and we'll talk about that, but go ahead and run with that. I, I think you were gonna jump in with something. No, I was just gonna, that's an excellent illustration there. And I think, uh, Talab uses another example of like, that's why all the pilots that aren't skillful are under the sea, you know, like if you're not a good pilot, you end up dead basically. Um, so there's this sur survivorship bias that all the pilots that we get tend to be, you know, at least skillful enough to keep the thing in the air. <laughs> um, I want, I, I, I want to drill on this. There's a beautiful statistical example from this. It actually comes from world war two and there was, there's a famous statistician whose name escapes me now, but so, so here's what happened. They were looking at the bullet patterns on the undersides of planes that came back, okay? The naive engineer said, wait a minute, wherever the most bullet holes are, this is where we need to enforce the armor under the fuselage of the plane, okay? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The intelligent engineer realized, wait a minute, the planes that were shot outside of these locations never came back and we have no data on them. So, so, so that, so actually looking at the data actually told you exactly the wrong thing to do. Looking right. at the data told you, Hey, we need to reinforce this area where the most holes are. No, the reason the most holes are there is because those weren't harmful and those didn't prevent planes from coming back. And, and I, and I want to get into a really concrete example from UC Berkeley in just a second, but I, maybe you were going to amplify a little there. I'll just read the excerpt here so we can hear it in, in souls words, but it's really just, um, reinforcing the point. I think he writes quote, on well, the chances of having any one of the five prerequisites, which we're basically calling initial conditions here, are two out of three, as in the example above, the chance of having all five simultaneously is two thirds multiplied by itself five times. That comes out to be 32 out of 243 in this example, or about one out of eight. In other words, the chances of failure are about seven out of eight. All those people with fewer than five prerequisites have the same outcome failure. Only those with all five of those prerequisites succeed. This creates a very skewed distribution of success and nothing like a normal bell curve of distribution of outcomes that we might expect otherwise. Yeah. So he's showing there that in the complete absence of discrimination, even we're going to show in the complete absence of human intervention. So he says earthquakes, tornadoes, lightning, these are very unevenly distributed. So nowhere in nature and nowhere in the history of mankind, even when discrimination is provably absent, is there ever a case where anything has been randomly distributed? 
And, you know, it made me think how ironic the statist vision is because they come in some sense with a very fascist ideal. And they say, if the composition of your group doesn't look like random chance, you must be discriminatory and we need power or control over you. And here's the funny thing. You know what happens when you have cells that just multiply randomly and don't affect the histological order of your body? You have cancer and you die. Mm. So there's nothing about life that's random. And this is a deeply absurd statist idea that every time that no matter which group of people we look at, we must see an equal random distribution of outcomes or there was discrimination. Yeah, it's, it's an excellent point. Um, you know, he goes on to write, it's in every domain, like you just alluded to geological features like lightning strikes and whatnot. He talks about, um, he writes here, most professional golfers have never won a single PGA tournament in their entire lives. While just three golfers, Arnold Palmer, Jack Nicholas, and Tiger Woods, have won more than 200 PGA tournaments between them. Moreover, there are similarly skewed distributions of peak achievements in baseball and tennis, among other endeavors. So it's this, um, it's a power law distribution, right? That we expect to see that the idea of trying to, this is something that's intrinsic to nature. And the idea of uh, a state trying to counteract that is, it's really just one of the most destructive, self-destructive things you can do. Um, I sent this tweet out yesterday that this might be a little bit esoteric, but kind of points at this as well. I wrote that when equality is made an absolute, humanity is aimed at pure entropy. In other words, humans can only achieve true equality in the grave. And I think that's, it's almost like we have to accept this, um, the nature of reality itself, that it does occur in these power law distributions this including human affairs, our socioeconomic experience of life, but also in geology and other domains. Um, I'll throw it back to you for a minute. I want to find that quote about, about the lightning strikes, though, if I can. Sure. And, and I would add to that, not only do these power law distributions exist, they're good for us. And I want to use the statistic of income inequality and say, mm. you know, the upper 1% are as different from one another as we are from them. That's yeah. actually another way of stating a scale-free distribution is that, you know, no matter how closely you zoom in on the curve, you're going to see the same levels of acceleration. And even at the highest, highest, highest levels of income, they actually show the highest turnover. Mm -hmm. Guess what? Isn't that a wonderful thing? Because it means that anybody from the lower strata, and this is exactly what you see in capitalist nations and in America, and pretty much only in America, where you have tremendous income mobility, where you move from the lowest quartile to the highest quartile. And over the course of your life, you may move to, to different levels. I'm really glad you brought up the golfing example because that another way of looking at ergodic systems, they're not decomposable. So the ensemble, the total average probability is not the same as the individual probabilities. And watch this. In golf, Let's say that you need five skills to, to be a world-class golfer. You, you need putting, driving, and something else. I'm just, I just don't know enough about golf to make up those other characteristics. Guess what? If you look at each of those individual qualities decomposed, you're going to see a bell curve. You're going to see a bell curve. You're going to be, see a bell curve. But the Tiger Woods of the world occur where five or more bell curves elapse, and then they get the lion's share of the results. And the beautiful thing about this and this market process, which authoritarians so deeply fear, is that the people who will be selected for those leading qualities are precisely the people who satisfy the needs of the consumers the most. And what we villainize or what statists like to villainize, which is profit, is not something extra. It is simply a measure of how much efficiency those individuals are generating. I want to give one example, and then I'm going to, I'm going to kick it back to you. And this will kind of, again, show how statistics are used to lie. And they are often the product of a misunderstanding. So the year is 1972 or 1973. And on the heels of the 60s, the University of California, Berkeley is evaluating their admission statistics, okay? They look at these statistics in the aggregate and they see, oh no, we are, we are discriminated against women. Women are not getting into Berkeley as easily as men do. Statistician by the name of Edward Simpson uh, examines the data and he takes the data and he divides it by department. Guess what the cause of this was? Women, tend to apply to more competitive departments. And when you look at the groups individually, guess what? Berkeley was actually slightly discriminating against men relative to women. Mm. 
So census paradox is this idea is that you have these aggregate statistics. I want to give you many examples of this because it's very important in, in destroying the ways that people, governments especially, lie with statistics. So this is one example where it looked like women were being discriminated against. But when you actually look at the individual data, individual groups, individual factors of success, the reverse was actually true. And a similar example occurred kind of in, in this, you know, within the last decade, maybe within the last five years. So Google, which is America's preeminent woke company said, wait a minute, we want to make sure we're not underpaying female engineers. They did a salary survey of the whole company and actually turned out they were underpaying male engineers by just a little bit. So this is why all Sol is asking us to do, first of all, in no case does he ever justify discrimination. And we're going to talk more about that. And discrimination is a horrible thing when it's not based on information, but just based on hatred. We all want individuals to succeed on their merits. But what he's destroying is this idea that just because somebody has a number and a good slogan that you should do what they say, because very oftentimes they're statistically illiterate. What is it? Lies, damn lies and statistics. So <laughs> now I'd like to tell you about a great new Bitcoin show on the scene that you've got to check out. Brought to you by Swan Studios and Bitcoin Magazine, this show is Hard Money with Natalie Brunel. Natalie is an Emmy-nominated journalist bringing unparalleled experience to the Bitcoin media scene. And personally, Natalie is one of my favorite voices in the Bitcoin space. Each week on Hard Money, you'll get the top headlines of the week with analysis you won't find anywhere else. Hard-hitting interviews with amazing guests like myself and other top minds in the Bitcoin space. And the show will take you directly into the lives being changed by Bitcoin all over the world. Check out Hard Money at swan.com backslash hard money. Today, I want to tell you about our sponsor, CrowdHealth. So how does health insurance work? You send an egregious amount of money to an insurance company. They hold it in a pool of depreciating fiat currency. Then when you have a large health event, you have to pay them even more via your deductible. And then you hope they will cover your bill. And in fact, one in six bills are denied by healthcare.gov plans. It's time to take control of your own healthcare bills. I'd like to introduce you to CrowdHealth. It's a decentralization of healthcare using Bitcoin as an alternative to health insurance. Instead of sending fiat currency to a big corporation, you send that money to an account controlled by you, a portion of which is converted into Bitcoin. Then, if you have a big health event, you have a community of Bitcoiners that will use the money in their accounts to help you out. To get more details, go to joincrowdhealth.com backslash breedlove, where you can find the promo code for $99 a month for six months. Something else is just coming up to me on this topic is the, the idea of the Pareto principle. You know, a lot of people have heard of the 80-20 rule. Um, that's the thing that I think we're seeing at all different levels of analysis. Um, the, and this is, you know, 80% of the, actually, I'm not sure of a good example here off the top of my head. I was thinking that the, it's the mass of the stars in the universe, I think follows the Pareto principle, you know, sure. the structure of, of animal hierarchies, the structure of human hierarchies, all these things, um, have the Pareto principle in it. And it's basically that 80, 20 rule, right? Where 20% of the population creates 80% of the results. Um, and it's also right. something that's exponential, which is interesting. So if you do the 80, 20 on 80, 20, it'll be like 64% of the population will create 4% uh, or 4% of the population rather will create 64% of the results, something like that. Um, and the other on the topic of discrimination itself, I think he gives this amazing example that just focuses on firstborn children, right? Where, you know, he's isolated basically as much as you can, the variation, I guess, in, in socioeconomic prerequisites, right? You're the two children growing up in the same home, same parents, same income, same region. Like they have as much in common as you could possibly have yet for whatever reason, the firstborn seems to have all of these advantages, these empirical, I got not advantages, this higher probability of success across multiple domains accrue to the firstborn child across um, many households, all geographies, et cetera. Um, is that something you could expand upon a bit or should I jump into an excerpt here? 
prepare the excerpt I'll, and I'll make a little comment. And so first of all, this is an extremely robust, again, be careful with this word, it does cut mm -hmm. both ways, statistical result. Mm -hmm. And it shows that the firstborn, at least in wealth, I think in IQ as well. Mm -hmm. So very, very robust across European uh, countries uh, in the Americas, I believe even in Africa, you can show that the firstborn has much more successful outcomes than the secondborn. The secondborn has much more successful outcomes than the thirdborn. What does this mean? Here's what we know it doesn't mean. It can't be due to race. All right. <laughs> it can't be due to socioeconomics. Yeah. It can't really be due to upbringing. So here is an example where three people or two people born under the same roof, raised by the exact same parents, can have order of magnitude, multiplicative differences in their outcomes. And it's just a matter of happenstance. Sowell gives like kind of a guess reason. He said it might be due to the fact that the undivided attention of the parent is actually so valuable. And, and he gives another corroboration of this is that twins tend to have lower outcomes and lower IQs on average. And the reason is for whatever reason, raising two children causes the split of attention. But the key thing here, this is just a classic example of where we have a very large disparity and it has nothing to do with discrimination. Yeah, it's, this one's really impressive. So um, I think I'll read this here. He writes that a study of National Merit Scholarship finalists, for example, found that among fi finalists from five child families, the firstborn was the finalist more often than the other four siblings combined. Firstborns were also a majority of the finalists in two child, three child, and four child families. If there is not a quality of outcomes among people born to the same parents and raised under the same roof, why should a quality of outcomes be expected or assumed when conditions are not nearly so comparable? So again, um, I, you know, I don't know how he came up with this example, but it's honestly brilliant to just isolate all of these things that typically get blamed for the disparity in outcome. He's basically isolated them by, by focusing on children in a single household and still identifying disparity of outcome favoring the firstborn. I think that's so important because this is why the invincible fallacy is invincible. Because even though there's no historical precedent, no natural precedent for when things have ever been randomly distributed, people still keep coming up with and winning political power with the idea that people are different because of discrimination. And I wanna give an example. So we we're just talking about the Pareto distribution and the authoritarians and leftists will clutch their pearls and say, wait a minute, wealth is not equal, stop the show. Guess what? That's exactly what Marxists tried to attack. And they said, listen, the, the bourgeoisie have all the money, they've concentrated all the wealth. We're gonna flatten the Pareto curve. And what they actually did was never ever produced a nation where the workers in their Marxist nations were as wealthy as the poorest workers in the capitalist right. nation. Right. So they said, hey, here's an arbitrary feature of the world of reality that we don't like. And we're gonna try and flatten this. So they literally came in with the invincible fallacy and produced the opposite as the result. And what Sowell points out is that Marx was never empirical. He wasn't interested in looking at history. He wasn't interested in testing if ideas, his ideas worked. They don't. And so it is amazing that this fallacy even persists and is still used. It was the same idea behind Nazism. So in Marxism, it was this concept that greed or discrimination is what causes the, the bourgeoisie to have more than the proletariat. In Nazism, they went off and, and said the same thing about race. So again, here's two sides of the invincible fallacy. The invincible fallacy was used in both cases to seize political power and in both cases produced the exact opposite. And I wanna start introducing this idea of the cost of discrimination on the discriminator. So again, maybe some of you are familiar with Philip K. Dick, the man in the high castle. He wrote this counterfactual book about what would happen if the Nazis had won World War II. We'd be in a very different world. One of the reasons they didn't win World War II is that by virtue of their own discrimination, they forced Jewish scientists out of Germany and they failed to make the atomic bomb first. And so this is why what Sowell points out, uh, first of all, the three different types of discrimination, 1A is perfectly legitimate, you use information about the individual. 1B is at least rational, you use information about the group, I'll go give examples of this later. And type discrimination, discrimination type two is purely based on prejudice and hatred. So the Nazis discrimination type two only had a cost in a free market because the Jews could flee Germany and reach other parts of Europe, more principally reach America. 
they were able to be safe there and America could suddenly unlock the hidden potential in the multivariate distribution. The Jews already had the literacy, they already had the studiousness. And now, you know, we got the nuclear bomb first, right? So you, this is, I think the important thing to see here is that a free market and a free market alone makes discrimination type two expensive. And later on, I wanna give examples of where the government actually instituted discrimination type two while by attacking types 1A and 1B. I know it's a little dense, but but I hope you'll you'll kind of guide me so we can give some good examples. No, there. I think I'm I'm glad you're introducing that because it, it just speaks to the the analytical rigor that Soul puts into this these considerations, right? Can, really converting a lot of these subjective um, domains into something much more grippable, right? He's he's um, much more quantitative, I guess you might say. And that what occurred to me there as you're saying that is that act of fiat by Germany. All right, to be actively type two discriminating against Jewish people ultimately led to their downfall, right? In the war, it's it it called back to me the the thing with China, right? Where they thought, oh, we're the best in the world now. Let's shut down all of our relationships, all of our trade routes, and I think they banned. You couldn't even leave China, right? On on uh, expeditions and whatnot. So they <laughs> and they had they had cast iron a thousand years early. Like they were way ahead. And, and they sat on their loyals and, and what happened was they went backwards. So there's this element here of pride, great pride comes before the fall, right? When you think you're the best in the world, you're whatever, you're the German superior race or you're China superior country. Um, that attitude, even if it's expressed in, in fiat and policy can become uh, your downfall ultimately. So really interesting stuff there. Um, I want, I'll read one more excerpt here. Well, first of all, the he writes this to IQ data from Britain, Germany, and the United States showed that the average IQ of firstborn children was higher than the average IQ of later born siblings. Moreover, the average IQ of second born children as a group was higher than the average IQ of third born children. Then he goes on to say that consider how many things are the same for children born under the same born to the same parents and raised under the same roof, race, the family gene pool, economic level, cultural values, educational opportunities, parents' educational and intellectual levels, as well as the family's relatives, neighbors, and friends. And yet the difference in birth order alone has made a demonstrable difference in outcomes. Whatever the general advantage or disadvantages the children in a particular family may have, the only obvious advantage that applies only to the firstborn or to any or to an only child is the undivided attention of the parents during early childhood development. That's, I mean, super interesting to consider. Like, is, is it the attention of the parents itself that's creating this, this skewed distribution favoring the firstborn? Yeah, that's a real, that's a, so here's the interesting thing. And this is kind of why logical thinking and statistics are different. I think Sol even admits to not knowing what the cause is and not being clear on causation versus correlation. But he then says it is highly unlikely or the facts show the opposite that the disparate outcomes are due to discrimination. <laughs> that is the really crux of the whole thing. So Sol is kind of via negativa in some sense. He's saying like, here's what we know that it's not, it's not discrimination. It might be these other factors. But the important thing is politicians shouldn't use this as a rallying cry to seize power. And, and so I, I think the key thing to take from that is Sol isn't saying why he knows that these disparate outcomes between first, second, third, and fourth born are present, but he's saying that he knows why they're not there. They're mm -hmm. not due to discrimination. Mm -hmm. It would be highly, highly unlikely because again, these people have the same socioeconomic, same parents, same access. So it's not due discrimination. And this is a classic example of where outcomes that we see in society and nature are highly skewed for reasons that have nothing to do with race and nothing to do with genetics and nothing to do with discrimination. Yeah, excellently said. Um, and it's just, it's incredible that, you know, we, we can't know what the reason is, but it, it, it's clearly not the reasons we typically think they are, or we're typically told that they are, right? Which would be all of these other domains. Um, so yeah, I, if I, just I can love, jump in. Yeah. You, you gave me a really good prompt there. And I think soul, the soul of economics, S-O-U-L, 
The soul of economics is the study of hidden consequences. Mm -hmm. And in discrimination and disparities, soul is showing us that what appears to be true on the surface isn't always the case. And this is really where broken window fallacy and Henry Hazlitt, who was one of Mises' students, gave this kind of extended definition of economic. That's the study of hidden consequences. And if we don't have this lens, if the people of America, if the people of Europe, if the people of any nation that is either free or aspires to be free are not economically literate, they're going to fall for these lies. And I want to give you a chance to jump in there. And then I want to give some examples, um, some more examples. And, and this is really the, the beauty of Sowell's book is it's just example after example after example, because the invincible fallacy doesn't die easily. So, so I want to give some more Simpsons paradoxes, basically, where it looks like discrimination is at play, but in fact, something very different is happening. Yeah, please go ahead, actually, because the next excerpt, I'm going to jump into another topic. So there are all different kinds of ways you can lie with statistics, and I'm going to give you one example. If you look at socioeconomics or you look at economic outcomes in America, you're going to see that Japanese Americans do better than Mexican Americans. And the immediate thought might be that America is racist against Mexicans. When you actually drill into the statistics, Mexicans as a population are younger and Japanese as a population are older. And guess what? Income trends with age. It has nothing to do with discrimination, at least nothing to do with type two discrimination. Here's another example. Traffic stops. If you, if you look at traffic stops, you will see an overwhelming proportion of African-Americans, something like twice as many traffic stops are of African-Americans over whites. Now, if you're not careful, you'll jump to the conclusion that the police are structurally racist and they're trying to selectively stop and harass black people. Here's the truth. Again, the actual hidden variable is age. African-Americans as a population are younger and younger people are more likely to speed. It has nothing whatsoever to do with race. And third example, just to drive that home, if you looked at statistics in the NBA and said, wait a minute, African-Americans, I'm making up a number, have five times the number of fouls as non-African-Americans. Everyone can immediately see the fallacy in that. It's the reason because the background probability, just the, the a priori distribution of African-Americans in the NBA is much higher. It, there's it's nothing to do with discrimination. And so here again, we have all these empirical examples of where there's very disparate outcomes and we have to be very careful. We have to x-ray what politicians say and we have to all become statistically literate so we don't fall for what I'm gonna call the, the status syllogism. And it looks like this. Here's what status always said. They say that the, the past was a tragedy, the present is a crisis, and the future will be a paradise if you give me the power. And the way that they justify their lie that the past was a tragedy is they use all these inequality statistics when, again, in fact, never in the history of society, never in the history of nature, was there ever, first of all, random equality. And second of all, these unequal outcomes of the past have nothing whatsoever to do with discrimination or race. Yeah, a lot, lots of good points there. Um, I, you know, I, I feel like it's useful just to mention this, like that Thomas Sowell himself is an African American. So just for anyone that might be listening to this and they think, oh, who's this guy writing about, you know, oh, race is not an issue in determining for cops to determining who they pull over. Like it's not like this is some guy that's trying to put in, you know, slide in a a racial. Um, slanted perspective in his work like the, i just think it's important for people like when they're like oh man this guy also is an african-american so clearly he's not um not an undercover racist i guess you might say at least towards african-americans presumably he's not an undercover conservative either and you know <laughs> one of the things we were talking about in the warm-up is that thomas Sowell began life in school as a marxist he trained i believe at university of chicago under the great milton friedman and he actually left still a Marxist. And it wasn't until he worked for the state and the Department of Agriculture, and he has this whole humorous anecdote, actually. He basically, there was some kind of question about what law they should implement. And then Sowell, here's this young guy fresh out of the University of Chicago. He says, look, why don't, why don't I get some data to see if our assertions are actually valid? And everybody went stone-faced. And he said that the aura in the room was, this young man will be the death of us all. Because again, the government prefers to operate on invincible fallacies. And as soon as anybody brings up data, not just data, but the correct statistical interpretation of that data, 
they actually get afraid. So very important point that she made is that you cannot argue that Thomas Sowell is either A, a racist, or B, that he's even a closet conservative because he started out life and persisted as a Marxist after training under Milton Friedman. He gives a great anecdote too. And it shows how the free market mind is more intelligent and moves faster than the government. So this guy kind of very academically pedigreed, had seen a lot of professors. And the year, it's before the Civil Rights Act. I think the year is right around 1960. So right, right around in that range. The first African-American secretary he has ever seen working for a white professor is Milton Friedman's success, it, Milton Friedman's secretary. And it's before desegregation and the Civil Rights Act. And, and you know, this kind of goes into exactly how people who exercise tied to discrimination impose penalties on themselves and only a free market can get rid of that. And one, one quick example, and then, and then I'll, I'll flip it back over to you. It's that 30 years after slavery had ended, it was very common for blacks and whites to sit together in transportation. And guess who liked this, the transportation companies? Because if they had to provide segregated seating, sometimes one section would be over full or one section would be under full, and they might even have to get two separate cars, one for each rate. For people, we literally don't care about their color. We want to put them wherever they are. And it was also the convention in America, again, 30 years after slavery, for blacks and whites to sit together. Nobody had any issue. It certainly wasn't the quote unquote evil corporations. What happened in the subsequent 10 to 50 years is governments came in and began to mandate segregation. That drove profits down for the industry. And it also created a kind of, they institutionalized type two discrimination. So uh, again, I know there was a lot there, but it's so interesting. It's interesting. Governments aren't evil, but they are short-sighted. And when they think in terms of averages and statistics, and they don't have the 1A intelligence of how individuals are different, they kind of come in and start to what Sowell calls the unsorted people. So people left to their own devices will sort themselves. That's going to cause unequal outcomes. Again, nothing to do with race, nothing to do with discrimination. And then government comes in and says, hey, wait, we're going to help. And what they do is unsort and destroy the achievements of minorities. And I'll, I want to flip that back to you, and then we'll, we'll talk about Dunbar. Yeah, that's a really, really good point. Um, and then again, to tie this back to complexity theory, this is self-organization, what, what soul I think calls self-sorting. Um, and we observe this everywhere in nature, right? You know, ants self-organize, they don't have an ant government necessarily. Um, and, you know, I guess to your point, government is short-sighted in that it's the means that it puts forth actually produce, produces outcomes opposite to the intention. So I'm not sure even, I don't know the, the history of, of government enforced segregation on buses, but I'm, I'm assuming that the intention was not to destroy the profits of the transportation industry, right? It's, um, well, the, this is a good case where the selfish desire for profit actually was great for equality. Exactly. Because the profiteers don't care if you, what your skin color is or how much melanin right. you have. They're right. put, put you in a car and get where you're going. And like to give, I want to give a really concrete example of these kinds of, of government externalities, and there's so many subtleties to tease out here. So if you go back, I think roughly to the 1930s, well before the civil rights era, the unemployment level between black and white teams, teens, black and white teens, was the same. I think they both had, I don't know, somewhere between five and ten percent unemployment. The minimum wage be began to rise, and then through about 1940, I think Stiglitz said this, inflation essentially repealed the minimum wage. So even though there was a minimum wage, there was no effective minimum wage because it was never rising fast enough with inflation. Now, here's where things get really, really interesting. As the government enforces minimum wage laws, it disproportionately hurts and hurts very badly black teens. And black teens start to have a multiple of unemployment of white teens. And you have to use a little bit of economic thinking to understand why. Here's the reason. When the minimum wage is low, you have to hire whoever is available because labor is scarce. And you can't afford to be a racist grocery store owner and say, I'm only gonna hire people of this color or that color. You have to hire whoever is available and whoever is capable. Now watch this. When the minimum wage is artificially high, there is now a huge pool of applicants. And guess what? You can now hide your type two discrimination. Market forces do not force you to hire any qualified person. It's the same as sitting on the bus. Market forces do not 
force you to hire any qualified person. You can be the racist, the dirty racist that you secretly are in your heart and nobody will see it. And the government will pretend that they are making life better for African-Americans when they're doing the opposite. And it hurts, the minimum wage hurts, again, externalities, hurts the lower socioeconomic strata because now they can't even get their first job. And if they can't get their first job, they can't get their second job. They are literally structurally keeping people poorer by enforcing an artificially high minimum wage. Last point, and it's on survivorship bias. So first of all, I guess kind of the third, and what are the different ways that statistics lie? So, so one are surveys. Uh, the second one, which we talked about, it wasn't just statistics, it was household income. And Sowell makes this point that they use a lot of, even the great Princeton used a lot of survey data to justify minimum wage increases. And think of the survivorship bias. You may now survey a bunch of people that have jobs and they're gonna all be like, I'm earning more, but the real minimum wage is zero. And the people who got hurt are the people who were barely coming out of poverty. Yeah, man, it's so, so much good stuff there. Yeah, and to tie this to the work of Mises, you know, he, he writes that in a free market, consumers are sovereign. So to your point, the bus operator doesn't care your skin color. He just wants asses and seats so he can have, yep. you know. <laughs> and as full as possible, right? Yes. Not two different buses. Yeah. Right. So he can generate as much revenue per unit of his capital investment, right? In the bus and the infrastructure and all of that. And um, on the point of, of unemployment and minimum wage, Mises also makes the point uh, the only way to eliminate what he calls institutional unemployment is to eliminate the minimum wage, because what you're effectively doing is price fixing the market, right? You're not letting the market clear where the supply of labor meets the demand for labor. You are artificially, arbitrarily fixing this price, right? Which we call the minimum wage. And that creates shortages, or, or I guess in this case, if it's a minimum wage, it's going to create unemployment, which would be a uh, labor surplus, right? There's excess labor that's not being put to work, basically because they would go to work for a lower rate, but the government won't let you won't let employers pay a lower rate. So this whole that we're back to this idea of right, the intervention creating the opposite of its intention in a way, which presumably the, the intention of minimum wage is to make sure everyone kind of gets their fair pay. But it's actually structurally uh, inhibiting the working class. And I love the point you made where if you can't get your first job, right, everyone, when you first come into the workforce, you're probably going to get minimum wage or something close to it. And uh, you're not worth much. Like what skills do you have? Right. You, exactly. you need to acquire some skills on the job. Yeah. But you can't. But if you can't, because there's this, you know, there's a bunch of institutional unemployment due to the minimum wage itself, you can't get the first job. Well, then you're set up for automatic failure and getting the second, third, fourth, and so on. And it hurts the very people, the government and the status and authoritarians pretend to help. And I want to give another example. So be before the 1960s, be before Equal Employment Act, civil riots, the disparity in incomes between blacks and whites, blacks were closing the income gap faster. After the war on poverty, that acceleration actually decreased. And here again, it's the idea that the government is, and I want to give very specific examples, interfering with the ability of people to self-sort. And maybe the, the great place to start there is with Dunbar High School. So uh, as of, let's see, Brown versus Board of Education was, I think, 1954, right around that area. And before that, so for 85 years before that, there was an all-Black high school called Dunbar High School. And they had achievements that were far above any neighboring white high school. They were sending people to Amherst, sending people to Harvard, producing scholar after scholar. 85 years of achievements. Now, what was the important characteristics of Dunbar High School? First of all, it was all black. So admission characteristics had nothing to do, well, I guess reverse race in some of this, but admission characteristics had nothing to do with race. The high school was able to select who could join the school. The government then came in on the heels of Brown versus Board of Education. And again, nobody is defending Brown for Sport of Education is morally correct that anybody should be able to attend any school, but the government actually came and destroyed that. So they went into Dunbar High School and said, wait a minute, you can't be selective in admissions anymore. We're going to tell you who can come in. You must admit everyone from the local area. What happened as a result is the self-sorting ability of Dunbar to keep disruptive individuals out of the classroom disappeared. And now because they had to, quote unquote, help everyone and pretend that everyone was equal when they're not, even if they're the same race, they now admitted a bunch of disrupted students and 85 years of black achievements in education were destroyed 
by the government forcibly unsorting people. And, and this to me is very painful, Robert. It, it's painful as somebody whose parents came to this country as immigrants to watch people like Elizabeth Warren and people like Bernie Sanders pretend that they're here to help and in the process destroy the ability of societies to self-sort and hurt the very people that they're pretending to save. It is deeply ironic and it kills me. Yeah, it's it's quite uh, tragic, especially when they keep winning hearts and minds with their rhetoric, right? And people just aren't, they haven't read Thomas Sowell, right? They're not thinking through it. <laughs> 